I heard a pastor tell a story uh, about a guy who was visiting a nutritionist, and he said, I-, I need some help. I need help change my diet. And he says, oh, okay, well, what's the problem? He says, well, every time I go to the grocery store, I find myself wanting to eat dog food. It's weird. I walk in, and I just feel inexplicably drawn to the dog food section. And when I'm there, I'm just staring at the pictures of the dog, how happy they look. It looks so yummy. And, and, and I just think, man, it would be so fun to play with those dogs and, and eat this food. And, and sometimes I just rip, on op- or rip open the bag and just start chowing down right there. And it, it's obviously unhealthy. I get too excited. I, I just feel like, you know, I want the dog food. And so the nutritionist was confused by this. He's listening. Okay, I've never heard anything like this. Yeah, I, go, I just start barking and howling when I eat the dog food. It's weird. It's an obvious problem. I need to change. So can you help me change? So the nutritionist says, well, let's start at the start. Um, that doesn't really sound like a dietary challenge. H- how long have you been like this? And the man resp- responded, ever since I was a puppy. Um, <laughs> y- you know, your, your actions flow out of your identity, right? Who you see yourself to be is what you end up doing. Your actions flow out of your identity. And uh, to be a Christian uh, is an identity. It's, it's who we are. And there are certain actions that ought to flow out of that identity, right? And one of the things we've been talking about here is there's a sort of discipleship crisis sometime in the modern church, I think, where people can associate themselves with Christianity, and yet their lives do not reflect the teachings and the way of Jesus. And this is true on like a mass level, I think, but also even in my own personal lives, I see a disconnect between what I believe and how I want to behave. Are you guys with me there? Anyone else? Don't leave me up here. Don't look at me like that, okay? Um, but the disconnect of why is it that I am not as transformed as I'd like to be. And so this series is examining why is it that we have that disconnect. And how do, we, how do we work towards that gap being lessened. And so what we've been doing is unpacking in scripture how to reconnect our hearts to God. And then how to be transformed by his presence and power in our life. And so week one, what I gave you was this paradigm for discipleship. And what I said is that uh, the goal of being a Jesus follower, or the word we use is apprentice of Jesus, is to be with him, and because of our time with him, become like him, and then do what he did. And so there's kind of this very obvious model there. Be with Jesus, become like Jesus, do what Jesus did. And uh, this goes right back to the very first followers of Jesus. When Jesus said, follow me, it wasn't a metaphor. It wasn't like, yeah, I'll meditate and sing songs about you on Sunday, right? It wasn't like a a, a metaphor. It was like, okay, I'm selling my stuff and I'm going to live my life following you in your presence every day. And based on what I see of you, I'm going to imitate those actions and then become like you. That was the relationship between a rabbi and a disciple. And what we're saying is it's no different today. To be a disciple of Jesus is to spend time with Jesus and then to become like Jesus. And so in order to uh, learn to cultivate a heart that wants to spend time with Jesus, week two, we said that one of the biggest obstacles we face is time. I mean, how many of you, someone asks, how are you doing? Very first thing out of your mouth is busy, right? I'm busy, I'm busy all the time. You're just busy all the time. And what I, what I offered to you is a suggestion that maybe uh, hurry is a state of the heart. More than it is a schedule issue, it's a heart issue that we are busy because we have busy hearts. And a busy heart is a hard heart that has no space or time to cultivate being with Jesus. And and, and so like this is why prayer time starts and then three minutes in you're thinking about tacos. Anyone, right? Or two minutes in you're thinking about all the things you got to do or all of a sudden you're back asleep, right? And like that happens a lot of times because spending time in the presence of God is difficult when everything around us is, is calling for our attention and distracting. There's, you know, we have uh, social media and we have friends and we have our to-do list and we have uh, just so many things vying for our attention that our hearts have picked up the pace of the world around us. And so one of the things I talked about in that sermon is uh, there's been sociological studies that show that you will walk at the pace of the city you live in. So, like, if you live in New York City, your pace will be different based on the pace and rhythms of the city versus a place like Brawley, right? Have you ever been to New York City? Everyone's in a hurry. They don't even know where they're going. They're just in a hurry. They're just walking really fast everywhere, right? And if you're a tourist, you're, like, kind of 
overwhelmed by the pace of everybody walking. It's just a different vibe. It's a different beat that everyone's, you know, walking to. And, and spiritually speaking, if we are not intentional and deliberate about the pace of our spiritual lives, it will begin to pick up and reflect the pace of the world. And so the big idea there was let's hurry up and slow down because that's going to be one of the biggest obstacles to cultivating time with Jesus, to being with him. It's saying, man, we should slow down, pump the brakes, spend time with him. And so then last week we talked about really the journey of spending time with Jesus as an inward, private, intimate devotional life versus a public, outward, performative one. And we contrasted the Pharisees, whose ministry is very outward, very obvious, very there for everyone to see. And then we, we, we talked about this other space, this other time called the secret place, which is we don't want to perform our righteousness in the public's eye to get their reputation, to get their approval, to get their applause, but rather we want to cultivate authentic connection with God when only God can see. And so the idea here is the religious people, and I'm using that term pejoratively, I'm using that term negatively, people who only care about looking righteous have this overemphasis on reputation and the eyes of other people. And so they always want to be perceived and known as good, moral, and religious, but their interior lives are broken and far from God. And this is one of the people groups that Jesus will attack most viciously and most often. He calls them snakes. All right, if Jesus calls you a snake, you're in trouble. You know what I mean? Like you snake, right? Because they are just so um, venomous about the way they live their lives. They're, they're two-faced. They're, they burden people and they make God feel inaccessible and far. And outwardly, people think they are so holy, but Jesus says they're actually like uh, if you washed a tomb. Outwardly clean, inwardly dead. And that's how God experiences them. And Jesus can pick up on them. And Jesus says, I can tell you this way because you don't love anybody around you. You're not actually a loving person. You just want to be known as a good person. You've disconnected those two. And so we, we talked about cultivating time in the secret place, cultivating time one-on-one -on -one with Jesus where there's no one's eyes but God. And therefore, there's no ulterior motives for why you're, why you're there, right? Like you're not going to trick God in those moments. So if you're trying to pretend and perform in the presence of God, what's the point? And so that secret space creates a, a, not only a safe space, but an honest space for you to give your actual real heart to God. And that's when you begin to actually be with Jesus. Here, I'm just going to bring it to you as I am. And so today, what I want to talk about is, what is the goal of being with Jesus? Well, one of the goals, at least, is to become like Jesus. Because if all you're ever doing is spending time with Jesus, but that doesn't actually result in transformation, there's also a problem there. And so today we're going to talk about spiritual formation. And spiritual formation is the spirit-led transformation process of becoming like Jesus. The spirit-led transformation process of becoming like Jesus. And what I want you to get a sense for here is that um, the goal of, of of transformation is to become like Jesus. That's obvious, right? But sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we think I want to be a good person or I should vote a certain way or I should do certain activities and we disconnect that transformation process from the image and likeness of Jesus. And so our goal as Christians is to be with Jesus and then by the power of the Holy Spirit become like Jesus. And of course, in the first century, to follow Jesus was a literal thing, no metaphor there. But nowadays, Jesus isn't here. He, he's not here with us physically. And so how do we spend time with Jesus? Well, we spend time with Jesus by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, if you're not a Christian, you don't know about this Christian doctrine, the Bible says that God is Father, Son, and Spirit. There's three persons, one God. And God has always existed in this eternal community. God's always been a friend and had friends. He's always lived in community. That's why the Bible says God is love. Not God became love when he created because he had someone to love. God's always been love within himself, Father, Son, and Spirit. And so in this communal, this sort of communal triune God, um, when he creates, he creates out of the overflow of that, and, and we're created to have relationships with him and, and, and with others like him. Well, this God sends Jesus, his son, to die for our sins, and then he sends his spirit to fill us with new life. And so we have God the son dying for our sins, and then we have God the spirit filling us with new life. 
And, and what the way the, the Bible will describe this process of being filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time is there's lots of images. It talks about being made alive. You're dead and now you're alive. It talks about being born again. Uh, we use the language of a conversion experience. But there is a, a spiritual tr- uh, process where we are not with Jesus and now we are, where we are renewed or made alive. Something happens distinctively. Um, the, the Old Testament, when, it was, when the prophets would, would dream about what this might look like, they would often describe it as receiving a new heart of flesh. And, and the idea was that our hearts are stone. They're impenetrable, and they can't be molded. You ever tried to mold a stone? You can't do it. It's rock solid. And, and our hearts, apart from the love and, of Jesus and the power of the Spirit, are rock solid. But what Jesus does, what God the Father does, is he gifts us the Holy Spirit. God himself comes to indwell us, and that gives us new hearts of flesh that are malleable, that can be formed and shaped and transformed. So think rock Play-Doh, okay? You had a rock heart that was solid and impenetrable, and now you have a Play-Doh heart that can actually be transformed and molded into the image and likeness of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit gives us this new heart. And it is the the power to become transformed to look like Jesus. And so Jesus will even go so far to say in John 16, 7, here's the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away physically. For if I don't go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In another part of that, that, that section, he says, he's another one like me. He, he's like me. He's here to help and save. But he's going to be inside. And all I could ever do is be beside you. And so, so here's like the uh, kind of crazy thing that Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying that it is better for you and I to have the Holy Spirit inside than have Jesus beside I don't know, it's like one of those wild things, right, that I'm not sure we all believe. Like, I, I don't know if I believe it all the time when I hear that. And Jesus says some pretty wild stuff, right? Jesus, I'm really worried about the bills. Consider the lilies. You're like, what? Like, pay the bills, right? Jesus does stuff like that where it's very disorienting. This is one of those moments, right, where he's like, hey, I'm out. And everyone's like, we're panicking. He's like, don't panic. It's going to be better. And everyone's like, how could it be better if you're leaving? And what Jesus is saying is, If you had me right next to you, coaching you through every single thing, do this and not this. Believe this and not this. Go this way and not this way. Guess what? Your hearts wouldn't actually want to obey. You don't need directions. You need a new heart with new desires. We don't believe that, right? Like, I want a life coach, Jesus. I want life coach Jesus right next to me, like send your kid to this school, uh, spank them this hard. Like that's what, you know, I want life coach Jesus telling me every step of the way, giving me a handbook, because deep down I believe that I am good enough inside to follow him in my own power and strength. And Jesus says, I disagree. That's why I got to go, man, to give you a heart, a new heart that's internalizing my law. I'm going to write it right on your heart. Because if I tell you from the outside, you won't believe it. It needs to be internalized. Jesus doesn't want to be your coach or your trainer. doesn't want to give you a how-to book. He, he wants to actually fill you with power. And so, so like the, the image I'll often give is to be a Christian is more like being Spider-Man than being Batman. Stick with me. I'm a nerd, but stick with me, all right? Okay, so Batman, his superpowers are mostly external. Right, have you ever thought about that? Batman don't have superpowers. He's rich, okay? That's about it, and which is a superpower. But, you know, he don't have real superpowers. He puts on a suit and he beats people up. He's angry and rich. You put those together, you're a superhero, okay? Or a villain, depending. But Batman, that's his, that's his MO, okay? And, uh, Spider-Man, now he has real superpowers. He gets bit, and what happens? He transforms from the inside, and, and, and now he can climb, he can climb, he can, you know, do the web thing. You guys know, right? He can, he's different. But his transformation isn't, I put on a suit externally, but rather my DNA structure is fundamentally changed. And so being a Christian is not this external thing, but this internal thing where we have new power. And that is what it means that Jesus says, that's what Jesus means when he says, it's better than me being beside you. I need to get inside you. And so I'm sending the spirit so that your faith comes with batteries included. You have everything you need to obey me. Because if I just coached you through every life decision, you wouldn't want to obey me. 
And, and then God the Father says, and guess what? It's not just like a one-time thing with the Holy Spirit. It's not just like, okay, I got the Holy Spirit. I got my batteries. I'm good now. But, but we need to apply the Holy Spirit and ask God for more of the Holy Spirit. And, and the idea here is that God says, um, you have the Holy Spirit, but God wants to give you more of his manifest power in your life. You need to ask for what you already have. Um, here's what Jesus uh, says exactly. He says, what father among you, if your son says, dad, can I have fish? Instead, you give him a serpent. Or if he says, can I have an egg? How many of you give him a scorpion? Now, let's just think about that. What do you want for, for, for dinner, son? How about fish? Here's a snake. Like, why, that doesn't happen very often. What do you want for breakfast? Let me have an egg. How about a scorpion? Right? Like, that's... You, if you're that dad, you need therapy, okay? Jesus says, no one's like that. You ask for one thing, you get what you ask for. So he says, if you, you're evil, you ain't got pure motives, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? He says, if you go to your father and say, would you give me the Holy Spirit? Don't you think he'd love to give you more of the Spirit? Because the Spirit's going to empower you to live like him and for him. The, the Father loves to give good gifts, and the best gift he could give you is the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the Father's heart. That's the Father's heart for you is to give you the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will be the one who will transform you to become like Jesus, which is what he wants. You guys will be in sync like that. And so um, that is the, the fatherly heart of God. God's not trying to hold obedience out from him say it's going to be really hard do it on your own he says no ask me and let me give you that's my heart for you a couple of years back I remember it was my daughter's uh, party she was turning I think three so it was like maybe two years ago right and my wife uh, her fault put me in charge of games you, know, you guys know how that goes predictable um, and so I went to the dollar store to buy prizes for the games because I'm balling like that and when I went to the, the dollar store which I always feel like a baller when I'm at the dollar store um, I got a little carried away next thing you know uh, I had 87 things in my basket. I'm not even playing. And I got to the front, and they're going, boop, 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 boop. And I'm thinking, poop, 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 poop. What am I doing here, right? My wife sent me to get, like, five prizes, and I got 87. You know what I mean? And, like, literally, the, my receipt was longer than CVS. It was crazy. And I felt so embarrassed. I wanted to take it back, but I was too embarrassed. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I meant to buy that third doll. Um... And, and, but here's the thing, I know why I did it, because I love my daughter. And as a dad, I want to give my daughter good things, dollar things. Wait a minute, this is breaking down. Um, I want my daughter to have the best party she can have, and I want her, all of her friends to get multiple presents, and that was my heart for her. I just want to bless my daughter, I want her to be happy. If that's me being evil, a sinner, limited, how much more does the Father just have a heart for you guys? Like, how much more does the Father want to actually give you what you need to be what he's calling you to be? And I know for some of you, your faith hasn't felt like that a lot of times. You felt like, man, I'm in the dark when it comes to obedience. I'm trying, and I fail, and I feel like God's mad at me. And, and, and really, that's not the picture of the Bible. Like, that may be something you've internalized somewhere else, but the, the biblical picture is, is God's not disappointed in you. He's a father who's trying to get you to a place. He might discipline you because he's a dad, but he loves to give you the power of the Spirit to obey him. He loves to give you the power of the Spirit so you can learn to be with Jesus and become like Jesus. And what you got to do is you got to ask. You got to ask for what you already have. So one author puts it this way growing in Christ is not fundamentally improving or adding or experiencing, but deepening. Implicit in the notion of deepening is that you already have what you need. Christian growth is bringing what you do and say and even feel into line with what, what you already are. So, so we're not trying to give you like 10 habits to help your spiritual life. We're going to talk about habits in a couple of weeks, spiritual discipline. That's an important part of this. But, but that's not the fundamental thing we're trying to do. And, and if you, we jump to the spiritual formation part of spiritual disciplines, reading your Bible, prayer, all important and essential for this you know, transformation process. But if we jump to that without stopping and saying, what you need is what you got, then, then what we do is we turn you into Pharisees who take the spiritual disciplines and say, I got to do this in my own power, in my own strength, in my own abilities. And I just want to pause for a week and say, actually, you already have everything you need to be what God's asked you to be. You have everything you need, not in yourself, but in Jesus. You have the spirit of God, and therefore, you can do this. 
Obedience is not like for extra super Christians. Living a life that resembles Jesus is not like varsity. You know, I'm still in JV, so I sin a lot. No, no the, the goal is to become like Jesus, and, and you have what you need in the power of the Spirit. Some Christians think we grow through pure behavior, one author writes. Others through sharper doctrine. Others through richer emotions. But real change occurs through this reality, the life of God in the soul of man. That's what the Spirit is. He's given you God's very life. And so the process of spiritual formation then is the Spirit-led process where we become like Jesus. And in Galatians chapter 5, the passage we, we read there, uh, Paul describes it this way. He says, I say, walk by the Spirit. You have the Spirit. Now, now walk according to Him. Walk in hand in hand with Him. And you will not gratify the de- desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. They're opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, not under the law. Here's the first thing you need to know about spiritual formation, becoming like Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Um, the way that Galatians says is, it's really inevitable. <laughs> it's inevitable. It's not optional. It's inevitable that if you're in the Spirit, you're going to become more like Jesus over the course of your life. It's a process. It's a, it's a direction. It's not perfection. But there will be a transformation process initiated by the having the Holy Spirit. It is an inevitable reality. And so if we want to break this down, there's really only two ways to live. There's to live life in the flesh, and we'll talk about what that is, and life in the spirit. Those are the two ways. And, and Romans 8 puts it very clear. It says, there are those who live according to the flesh, and they set their minds on things of the flesh. And then there are those who live according to the spirit, and they set their minds on things of the spirit. If you set your mind on things of the flesh, that's death. If you set your mind on the spirit, that's life. The mindset in the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God. It can't. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So there's two paths here marked out for us. And I want you just to ask yourself, am I in the flesh or am I in the spirit? Because if you're in the spirit, you walk according to the flesh. But if you're in the, if you're in the flesh, you walk according to the flesh. But if you're in the spirit, you walk according to the spirit. If you're in the flesh, you live according to the flesh. You have this flesh mindset. But if you're in the spirit, you live according to the spirit. You have a spirit mindset. And the result of living in the flesh is death. There's a way that seems right unto man, that way leads to death. But if you live life by the Spirit, the result is life and peace. Here's the point. Your lifestyle is based on your mindset. Do you have a spiritual mindset or a fleshly mindset? Where is your mind set? On the things of God and His Spirit or on the things of the flesh? Because what the Spirit does is he helps you to obey and become like Jesus. Now this is completely, these two forces, the flesh and the Spirit, they are completely opposed to each other. They, 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 they don't, they're not friends. They're not even frenemies, all right? You guys know what frenemies are? Uh, they, they completely have no correspondence. They're enemies in opposition to one another. All right, And so to have the Holy Spirit is to completely change the direction from the way you're going. Um, and, and, and there's work involved, but really, the Spirit is giving new life. It's completely different from the direction you're headed in. So, so no one falls into obedience. We fall into sin, but not obedience, right? That's the default. The default is to fall into sin, not obedience. No one stubs their toes and goes, hallelujah. No one does that, because the natural default of our heart isn't, I stub my toe, let me give the Lord praise for every trial, Right, the default is to start saying ungodly words because, because it's easy to fall into sin and it's hard to walk by the Spirit it's, and they're opposed. And what the Spirit brings is obedience. N- not outcomes, obedience. H- here's what I mean by that. Sometimes we try to obey God because of the outcome but not because of the actual obedience itself. And so, so you obey because you think, if I obey, I'll get a good reputation. But sometimes sin will help your reputation. What are you going to do then? Do what's right, regardless of the outcome. Sometimes sin can calm you down more than obedience can. Jesus was very anxious in the garden, very anxious, sweating blood, and yet that was the obedient thing to do. Do what is right, regardless of the outcome. Sometimes sin can make you wealthy, and obedience can make you broke. Do what's right. Because we're not looking at outcomes, but on obedience. That's what it means to live life in the Spirit. 
And, and make no mistake, even though these two are opposite, and like I said, to live in the Spirit is inevitable for the Christian, sometimes we revert. Right? We, are, we see and sometimes we live like we're blind. We're adopted and we live like orphans. We're rich and we live like we're poor. We're found and we act like we're lost. Sometimes we are been made alive and we act dead. That's true, but the main direction of our life is inevitably towards becoming like Jesus. That's what the Spirit does. Second thing is, if you notice, this idea of the Spirit working in us is he produces fruit. And if you look at the fruit, they're not like um, actions. They're internal dispositions. Right? It says the, the, the Spirit produces fruit like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith. It doesn't say like, like tithing and going to church and reading. I wish it did say those. It don't say those. Okay? It, it says internal dispositions, not external actions. Now, the external actions come. Okay? But it's an internal disposition that is created because the work of the Spirit is at the end of the day, listen to me, about desires and not decisions only. It's about desires. You see, it says that the flesh and the spirit are against each other and that they don't, one desire is going to win out. It's about desires. What the Holy Spirit is trying to do is produce in you new desires, new loves, new wants. And that's why God will not settle for outward form only Christianity that performs and looks a certain way. He actually wants the real authentic thing with you. He wants your real true heart. Because there's an internal process that God wants to start in you. There's an internal process. Some of us, um, we are like fashion statement Christians. What, what, what I mean by this is we externally wear Christianity, but we actually don't live it out or really have it on the inside. It, it's kind of like, um, like there's a whole industry of like, like sportswear, but people who don't actually like do any sports, athletic, right? Like, girl, when was the last time you did yoga? You know what I'm saying? Like, you've been in those for three weeks, right? Um, hey, don't, don't, I ain't judging them. I'm just saying, right? But, like, it's a look now. You know what I'm saying? Like, bro, you look athletic. I sure do, don't I? You got the headband on, but you ain't never played sports in 10 years, you know? And, and, and that's how we do our Christianity. We have the part. But the inside, the actual thing itself is not actually happening. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't want you to play the part. He wants you to become the thing. He's not interested in your pretending and performing, so we'll say it again. Jesus cannot transform the person you're pretending to be, only the person you actually are. He doesn't deal in fantasy or hypothetical, only in actual reality. So bring who you are inside to him so that that can be transformed. And if you need like a, a like how do I do that? Read the Psalms. Because the Psalms are all about people being really honest, like scary honest. There's a Psalm that says, I hope that guy's wife is, becomes a widow. And I'm going, uh-oh. And he said, then I hope her, her kids beg for food and no one answers. I'm going, uh-oh, right? And I just keep reading it saying, uh-oh, at the end, and say, I've never been that honest in my life to anybody. And it's in the Bible. I don't know what to do with it. All right, pray for me. But here's the thing is, is, is what the psalmist is teaching us in that place and in other places is prayer is a space for the real you, the internal you, to actually come to God as you are, not as you're pretending to be. And what God will do in that place is he will transform your desires, which will lead to decisions, which will give you a direction, which will sow a destiny. A lot of us think that what God wants is just your decisions and just your direction. But the Bible says, no, God actually wants to deal in desire. And, 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 and it's your desire that he wants, and that will give you decisions that are new, and a new direction, and a new destiny. You say, well, what if I don't got the desires? That's where the Holy Spirit comes in, and God's desire for you overwhelms your lack of desire for him. And so God says, I want you, and that transforms you, so that when you don't want him, you begin to say, he wants me even when I don't want him. You think on that long enough, and you start to want him some. And you start to say, man, I, I don't want you yet, God, but I know I should, and I'm going to pray this because this is what I'm bringing to you, and God meets you in those places every time. And God wants the prayer of an honest man more than the prayer of a performing man. And so he says, let's meet in that secret, quiet, honest place. Psalm 51.4 says he wants honesty in the secret place, the internal place of our hearts. And when you get down there and you bring your honest self to God, he transforms you and gives you new dispositions. And he does do that work. 
And so now you have joy, peace, gentleness, all these things that you didn't have before, he is working in you. He's giving you new desires. And so what you see in the book of Galatians is that basically the flesh, we've been talking about the spirit and the flesh, can manifest in two ways. One is very obvious. It says, here are the works of the flesh, sexual morality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, things like these. Okay, how many of that, you read that, you're like, that's a Christian. Anyone? No, right? Right? Did I lose you at idolatry and sorcery? Okay, right? So like, those are pretty obvious sins. No one's going to debate orgies. Like, ah, that's a gray area, right? We're like, okay, yeah, that's clearly leaving la vida loca. Like, you've gone off the deep end. You don't get to be a Christian and just be like, yeah, I just went to my orgy last night. Sorry, God. Like, we know that, that, that when you're living a life that is engaged in these kinds of activities, that this is clearly contrary to what God asks of you. So I, I don't got to make a case for this manifestation of the flesh. This is what we might call the rebellious, wild, sinful life. But the more subtle way that the flesh manifests is not through rebellion and wild living, hedonism. It's actually through moralism. In fact, the whole book of Galatians was primarily written not to combat people who were living it up like this, but most of the book of Galatians was written to combat who? The legalist, moralistic, religious Pharisee types. That's what the whole book is written about. Right? So, so if you don't know the book of Galatians, I'll just give you a real quick summary. Um, there's some guys who are saying, if you want to be a Christian, you got to get circumcised and submit yourself to the law. Right? They're called the circumcision party, which that sounds like a party to me, but that's what they're called. And they keep telling everybody, you want to be part of the team of Jesus? you got to come under the law and approximate a Jewish birth. And um, Jews get circumcised on day eight. So you got to do that. you got to become a Jew. And they're adding all these rules and regulations and stipulations and rituals and external things and markers of how you become close to God. And Paul confronts them because it's dividing the church. It's hypocritical. It's self-righteous. And the language Paul uses in Galatians 3.3 is he says, some of you are trying to be perfected by the flesh. You're trying to become perfect in your own flesh. And so what the flesh is, is the flesh isn't just, oh, I'm living wildly sinful. The flesh is the autonomous self. I am living in the power of me for my glory. That's the flesh. And you can do that by becoming a good person or a horrible person. You can lead yourself into morality or you can lead yourself into immorality. The question is, who is leading you? Because the flesh does not care very much about which of those you choose. And so as Christians, we resist moral formation, and instead we invite spiritual formation to becoming like Jesus, which is different. We want changed desires. We want a real transformation. Because you can do good that isn't actually internally good. For example, you might become a good person because you think if I'm a good person, life will go well. In other words you're actually a control freak. And you're trying to bargain. You say, if I do good things, good things will happen to me. And so the fundamental sin is I want to manipulate and bargain and control my life. You don't have a changed heart. You're just finding a better way of manifesting your flesh. Or maybe you think, I want a good reputation in the community. I want to be known for being a good person. And so you're consumed with pride, which is a sin. You're watering pride and killing the rest of your sins. But you're still watering pride. Or maybe you're afraid of getting caught. And so you're actually, you're watering fear, and yet you look like you're a better person on the outside. You don't actually have changed desires. And so what moral formation does is it actually results in something really ugly. When it actually starts getting exposed, it, re- it, it manifests in relational immaturity. So this one guy, Peter, at this time, he's dividing up the church because he doesn't want to eat with the Gentiles who don't eat certain foods that the Jews eat, right? The Jews don't eat certain foods, very strict religious rules. And he's dividing the church up saying, oh, we don't eat with you. He's like in middle school again. And there's this religious immaturity. And, and Paul even says, man, you're leading everyone into an inconsistent hypocrisy. He says, you are a Jew And you live like the Gentiles. You live eating whatever you want when the Jews aren't here. So how are you going to force the Gentiles to live like Jews when you don't even do that? You tell others how to live. You preach, but you don't practice. That's hypocrisy. 
And there's a superiority complex here. They don't want to be known and seen as bad sinners when in fact they truly are. And again and again what we see is Paul saying, you know, the thing about these religious people, in fact, I'll show you because this one is one of the, the most stinging rebukes in my opinion. In Galatians 6, he says this, those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they want you to be circumcised so they can boast in your flesh. In other words, it's all about power for them. It's all about gaining control for them. They want to boast that they got you to follow the rules when they don't follow the rules. These spiritual leaders are actually power hungry and they want to make a boast of your flesh. And Paul says, that's not the way. And so here's what I I want you to catch. The flesh can be obvious, rebellious, sinful, wild living, but it also can be religious and moral and good. And so for some of us today, what we need to repent of is not bad, but our goodness. Because our goodness was done in our own strength for our own glory. And that is the key marker of the flesh. Moral formation is something we must resist. John Owen says, you, you got another heart. If you try to look outwardly good, you may have another heart that is more cunning, but not a new heart that is more holy. You might be tricking people better, but you're actually not actually transforming. And, and so the, the, the fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? The fruit of the Spirit, there's an obvious opposite of them. But here's the thing, there's also a subtle counterfeit. So I, I got this from a pastor. Um, I think it's really helpful. If, if love is about serving people for their good and their intrinsic value, not because of what it brings to you, the opposite of that would be this self-protective, abusive posture, fear-based relationships, Right? But the counterfeit, in other words, it looks like the real thing, but it's not. The religious kind of counterfeit of that is selfish affection. I'm attracted to this person. I'm going to treat them well because of what it does for me. It looks like love, but it's self-invested. Does that make sense? It really looks like it, though. But at the core, it's actually not motivated by serving them. Joy. So joy is delight in God's sheer beauty for who he is and, and what he's done. The opposite of joy is I'm hopeless. I'm despairing. I have no hope. But the counterfeit is, I'm happy as long as I'm experiencing blessings. And I'm happy not because of the blesser, because of the blessings. And my mood swings are based on my circumstances. So you say, how do I, have, how do I know if it's spiritual joy or just worldly joy? Well, does your joy rise and fall based on whether or not the blessings are there? Because the counterfeit joy is, I'm happy because things are good. But true joy is actually rooted and grounded and settled. And that's the fruit of the Spirit. So there's always counterfeits to every one of these fruit. Peace. Real peace is a confidence and rest in the wisdom and sovereignty of God. That that, that he knows more than you and he owns you. The opposite of that is obvious. I'm anxious and I'm worried. But the counterfeit of peace that looks like peace but actually isn't is indifference and apathy. You're not actually at peace. You just don't care. So you look calm, but it's because you don't care. You're not invested. Patience. Patience is the ability to take trouble without blowing up or hitting back, right? You're not just getting back at people. And and patience, the opposite of that's obvious. Revenge, resentment, I want to get back at you. The counterfeit of patience is cynicism or a lack of caring. You might say, like, ah, I don't want to get bothered by that. There's no, they're not worth it. Statements like that. You might look patient, but inwardly you're cynically destroying their value in order to be patient. You're not actually patient. You're just cynical, and you're actually being harsh in your posture. Does that make sense? So every fruit of the Spirit has an opposite, but it also has a counterfeit. And you need to avoid the opposite, but we also need to watch out for the counterfeit. Kindness. Kindness is, is, is this vulnerable, deep inner security. I want to be good towards others. The opposite might be something like envy or unable to enjoy others' success. But the counterfeit might be doing manipulatively good things so you can either congratulate yourself or get something from them. Maybe you want to feel good about yourself, so you're doing good, but the truth is you're doing it because you're hoping to be known and seen as a good person. Uh, Goodness, or it can be translated integrity. The idea of the spiritual fruit is that you're honest, you're transparent, you're just really um, the same person in every situation. You have integrity, you're good through and through. Well, the opposite's phony, hypocrisy. 
The counterfeit is, um, I'm going to give you truth, but I'm actually going to be loving. So, so I want to get this off my chest, you might say to someone, right? But, but you don't have the agony of like actually feeling bad about that. Faithfulness. Maybe you're really committed and, and, and you're, you're loyal and you're reliable to your word. Well, the opposite of that is you're opportunist, you're fair-weathered, you're coming in and out depending on the life situation. But, but faithfulness, the counterfeit can be, I'm going to give you love, but I'm not going to give you truth. I'm going to be loyal when you should actually be willing to confront. You know what I'm saying? So, so you're there, but you're not there in the way they need you to be there. And so it's actually a counterfeit. It's not the real thing. Gentleness. The idea of gentleness is self-forgetful. Well, the opposite of that's obvious. It's I'm superior than everybody. I'm self-absorbed. I'm self-important. The counterfeit might be this inferiority complex where you're just so self-conscious. Because at the end of the day, the, the goal of humility is to forget yourself, not to be less than others, but to think less than, to think about yourself less. Self-control. It's the ability to choose the most important thing over the urgent thing. The opposite of that might be this, indri- this driven, impulsive, uncontrolled person. But the counterfeit would be willpower based on pride and the need to be in control. So you may look very self-controlled, but at the end of the day, it's coming from a place that's rooted in your desire to control your circumstances or situation or how you look. So your willpower is what's at work there. Here, here's what I'm trying to get you to understand is the flesh is so tricky because he doesn't always just like, look like the opposite vices of the fruit. He sometimes produces, uh, the flesh will produce counterfeits that really, really, without examination, look like the spiritual fruit. And what we want is real, transformed hearts that are producing real fruit. That's what we want. Next thing about spiritual formation you got to know is like fruit, change is slow. It's gradual. It's gradual. You don't notice you're changing until you've changed in many ways, right? So maybe if you're like in the midst of a process right now where you're begging God for patience, God, make me patient, make me patient, and you keep on flipping out and you can, maybe you're growing patient. Maybe you got to be patient with your patience, right? Maybe you're growing patient, but the thing is you don't see the growth because it's gradual, so any of you guys like mark off how big your kids are getting and, and you don't see it overnight, right? You don't say like, oh, look, you grew like a point centimeter. You don't, right? but over like a year or two or three years, oh my gosh, you grew, you know, six inches or 12 inches or whatever, right? You see the growth exponentially because growth always happens gradually. So you may not feel like you're changing as you give yourself to the spirit and you give yourself to Jesus, but be patient with the process because like fruit, it starts small and it will ripen and grow slowly if you're staying connected. That's what the fruit are. The fruit of the spirit are gradual. Here's the last thing I want to say about the fruit of the spirit. They are symmetrical. And this is maybe one of the most important things you got to know about spiritual formation. Okay? Um, If you noticed, uh, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit wants to produce fruit and the opposite of the fruit of the spirit is what the desires of the flesh the works of the flesh verse 19 so the works of the flesh are plural but the fruit of the spirit is singular you guys ever think about that it's interesting it's interesting that that, the fruit is singular and the works of the flesh are plural i'm going to explain why i think that is The reason I think that the fruit is singular and the desires are plural is because what what God is telling us in his word is you cannot have one fruit of the spirit without the rest. They work together. What the flesh does is he makes us into, he he rips us apart and he makes us into disintegrated people who are um, compartmentalized, we're hypocritical, we're inconsistent, we act one way and do another thing. Maybe we're really, really patient, but we're not really loving or joyful and and we we settle and, oh, you know, I'm good enough, I'm this and I'm not that. And so when you look at the fruit of the Spirit, don't think, oh, which of these do I have? Look at how can I cultivate all of these because they actually all come together. They're one whole package because what the Holy Spirit is trying to produce in you is not fruits of the Spirit, lots of little attributes about you, but the fruit of the Spirit, one holistic character of integrity. He wants to produce a whole person, not pieces that resemble kind of makeshift Jesus, but one whole person who's becoming like Jesus in every part of your character. You don't get to pick and choose which fruit you like. Oh, I'll take some joy. Oh, I don't like self-control. Oh yeah, give me some love. Ooh, you know, faithfulness, patience, stay away from me. Like you don't get to do that. Think about it. 
Can you be really loving if you're actually not joyful? Have you ever met an angry, loving, oh, that guy's so loving, he's like pissed off all the time, rocking around, right? He has Uncle Jay's eyebrow, you know what I mean? Like the, the one painted on, right? The unibrow. You guys ever seen that person who's really angry and like really loving? Well, well no, because joy and love go together. Have you ever seen someone who's, who's really patient and, and, and yet they're out of control, they have no self-control? No, you've never met that person. Have you ever met someone who is uh, really um, faithful and they're uh, also, uh, but, but they're not gentle? Again, just look at them. They all go together. You can't say, I got this, but I don't have this, because God is not trying to produce fruits of the Spirit, but a whole character that works together. And so the reason that the fruit of the Spirit is singular and not plural is because what God is trying to produce in you is a character of integrity so that you are who you are everywhere you go and in every situation that you're in, whether you're in public or in private, whether it's inside or outside, every part of your character is being shaped to become and reflect Jesus. That's the character that God is trying to produce in you. A whole life lived wholly for God. Holiness is the idea that God is healing our hearts to become singularly integrated and connected and fully reflecting him. And so the fruit of the Spirit are symmetrical. That is spiritual formation. Jesus is trying to form in you to become a person of obedience. So what what, what the Pharisee will often say is, I want to do good things, but what the the, the spiritual formation person says is, I want to become a person who does the right things. It's not just about merely behavioral outside external actions, but it's about the transformation process of my character becoming the person who would obey. I want to become a person who would always be these things versus I want to do, 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 do. I want to become so that the doing is just naturally flowing. Uh, There's there's a guy I really look up to, and he, he describes his ministry to me often, and he says, I couldn't help but do it. I know exactly what he's talking about. He's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. He's saying, you couldn't stop me because it wasn't me. It was the Spirit producing this in me, and it was the inevitable outflow of my life in Christ. It just happened. And, and, and he's not bragging or trying to act like, like this super spiritual person. What he's saying is, when you live a life in the presence of God and under the power of God, over the course of time, the inevitable thing is your whole character begins to reflect Jesus, and you have integrity. That's the aim to actually authentically be transformed holistically in the presence of God. Some of you may be feeling a little overwhelmed by all of this, so let me, let me say this. Jesus died for those of us who are sinners, and that's all of us, and he died to make us new. And though it is true that we revert, the, the victory has been won. So World War II ended in 1945, and there was this man who was a Japanese army intelligence officer, and his name was Hiro Onada, and he held up for 29 years in the Philippines. He was unaware that the war ended, and he was reluctant to lay down his weapons, and he was hiding in the jungle for all those years. He was the, the last, one of the last to surrender, and he was holding out even though the war was lost. Friends, the war is over. There are parts of your character that have not realized that. There are flesh remnants that are holding out fighting. But make no mistake, you are more than conquerors in Jesus. He will make you into that person. So here's the good news. One day you will appear before Jesus whole. And we will meet one another in the presence of God and be the persons we always dreamed we could be. What a gift it is to partner in community and say, I want to see who you're going to be one day. I want to work towards that now on earth. I want to see, I see a heavenly person in you that's becoming like that. And one day we'll meet each other in glory and say, I knew you had it in you. I knew this is the person that you were becoming. I saw the trajectory. It was imperfect. It was limited. But man, I certainly saw the tastes of what could be. That is spiritual formation. It is the process of saying, I want to partner with God to see what he can do in you. And one day we'll be there. And it will be done. And until then, We press on.